experience the second work of grace known as sanctification to the people in the holiness movement. Sanctified means getting certain things out of your life that are destructive, that are sinful, and that's sanctifying oneself. I think sanctification is the second work, is a process that, because once you're born again, you are set apart and God begins to deal with you. You hate the things you once loved, you love new things, you know, you love things you never thought you would love. I think that's the process of sanctification. During that time, Seymour associated himself with the Evening Light Saints, also known as the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana. Daniel Warner's small denomination was known for its teachings on sanctification and on Christian unity. Members lived austere lives, patterned after the first century saints. They did not drink coffee, nor did they wear jewelry or attend popular entertainment. By 1904, Seymour had traveled south and west to Jackson, Mississippi, where he was discipled by Charles P. Jones, a co-founder of the Church of God in Christ. In 1905, Seymour moved to Houston, where a holiness preacher named Lucy Farrell introduced him to Charles F. Parham. Parham was the leader of the Topeka outpouring of 1901 and was a recognized full gospel preacher. There's been a lot of discussion between historians as to where the Pentecostal movement started. You have to say that the doctrine and the experience was pioneered by Charles Fox Parham in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas. That's the beginning of the movement as a distinct uh, theological movement with a distinct experience. They called it the touch felt around the world. And then his disciple Seymour comes to Los Angeles and the great Azusa Street revival takes place. But it didn't become a worldwide movement until Azusa Street. So what I see is that uh, you had two major founders of the movement, Parham and Seymour, and you had to have both. Seymour studied under the apostolic faith evangelist who taught three separate works of the Holy Spirit, salvation, sanctification, and the baptism in the Spirit. Based on the second work of grace, the sanctifying aspect is, is quite key because it was in the aspect of being sanctified that the group in Topeka, Kansas and other parts of the country uh, seriously sought God. They sought God because now when you start talking about living a certain life, ordering your life a certain way, now you understand that your energies aren't sufficient for that. Salvation, when a person receives Jesus Christ into their heart, the power of God is now living within them. Sanctification is the cleansing up of the old person into this new person because of the power of God operating in their life. Curiously, Palm's Bryan Hall Bible School was racially segregated, and Seymour was obliged to listen to Palm's lessons from the hallway. He was not allowed to sit with his white brothers and sisters in class, nor was he allowed to tarry with them at the altar. Those humbling circumstances did not make William Seymour bitter. Instead, they focused his attention on God. Years later, Parham would call Seymour the most humble man I ever met. While God humbled Seymour in Houston, the prayers of thousands and the work of many hands prepared Los Angeles for revival. It would be a great mistake to attribute the Pentecostal beginning in Los Angeles to any one man, either in prayer or preaching. Pentecost did not drop suddenly out of heaven. Frank Bartleman. This was especially true during 1905, when a physically infirmed Bartleman worked the streets of Los Angeles and called for revival wherever he went. Like a modern-day John the Baptist, Bartleman, an itinerant pastor, spent most of his nights in prayer, his days preaching, distributing tracts, and promising Los Angeles that revival was coming. 
Frank Barlowman is a funny, funny guy. He has an, uh, an odd pedigree in a sense. Uh, he's uh, reared in Pennsylvania. His father's a Roman Catholic. His mother is a Quaker. Uh, it's an odd mix. Uh, he is converted as a young man, I think, through Temple Baptist Church in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, is, feels like he's called into ministry. Frank Bartleman was not involved with the Topeka revival. He, he had come to Los Angeles from the east, but there was no connection between him and Charles Palm before he came and met William Seymour. Bartleman used to come and, and see my father, uh, and I remember he was uh, kind of a... Uh, a tall, stiff man and carried a little black bag. <laughs> oh, I was probably seven or eight, nine. Bartleman wasn't alone. Joseph Smale, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Los Angeles, sought more of God and traveled to Wales to meet Evan Roberts, leader of the Great Welsh Revival of 1904. That revival so changed the complexion of Welsh society that mules pulling coal loads out of the mines had to be retrained because the teamsters who urged them on now did so without anger or cursing. When Smale returned to Los Angeles, energized by the experience in Wales, he was instrumental in the birth of a revival that went on for four months, Smale promised his congregation. Pentecost has not come but it is coming. After 15 weeks of non-stop revival meetings that taxed his congregation's patience and tested their commitment, the pastoral committee of the First Baptist Church of Los Angeles voted to dismiss Smale, a disappointed Frank Bottleman comment. What an awful position for a church to take, to throw God out. While attending Bible school in Houston in 1905, William Seymour pastored Lucy Farrell's small holiness church while she traveled to Kansas with the Parms. A visitor from Los Angeles named Neely Terry attended services and came away impressed with Seymour. When she returned to Los Angeles, she recommended Seymour to a small group of believers pastored by Julia Hutchins. They sent Seymour train fare and invited him to come west. Although Parham did not feel Seymour was ready, Seymour felt differently. It was divine call that brought me from Houston, Texas to Los Angeles. The Lord put it in the heart of one of the saints in Los Angeles to write to me that she felt the Lord would have me come over there and do a work when I came, for I felt it was the leading of the Lord. The Lord sent the means, and I came to take charge of a mission on Santa Fe Street. Seymour crossed an America in which two out of three citizens lived rurally. There were 8,000 cars in the United States, but only 144 miles of paved roads. There were no skyscrapers in the Los Angeles of that day, even though the traffic was quite modern. Los Angeles had 256 churches, or one church for every 1,000 people. By February 1906, the hearts of many believers in those churches were on fire. Stirred up by the Holy Spirit, they felt that God himself was standing in the doorway. The Pentecostal manifestation did not come like a huge prairie fire. For years, there had been a necessary time of preparation as God readied the hearts of his people. At Reverend Smale's New Testament Church, believers joined hands one afternoon in February after a service and prayed that God would pour out his spirit speedily with signs following. Frank Bartleman. As Smale's congregation prayed, Julia Hutchins and the eight families that had sent Seymour train fare left the Bonnie Bray home of Richard and Ruth Asbury and leased a building on Santa Fe. There, they waited for the arrival of William Joseph Seymour.
As Seymour's train chugged westward across the Arizona desert, there were 46 states in the Union and $46 million in the Treasury.